Space between. Why, hello. This is the Space Between Podcast, and that was my wife's sweet voice. Uh, I'm, I'm missing her right now. I'm in Baltimore, um, but to finish the intro, this is the Space Between Podcast where we, myself, and today, Josh Blaylock, talk about the space between life and art. Never heard of it. Passion and business, what's happening now, and what's happening next. I'm Pat Shand. It's your boy, young husband on his own. <laughs> and this is Josh Blaylock. <laughs> Hello. What's going on, man? No, well, just uh, doing the same thing you're doing. Yeah, like kicking it after the out here two days in a row, two weeks in a row for me. Con Damn. to con to con to con to con. So yeah, for for those who don't uh, know, we're in Baltimore Comic Con. Uh, last week you were where? Damn, no, Chicago, Chicago, <laughs> Damn. home. I was at home. Yeah, that's how you know uh, yeah, that you're traveling. Me and my wife were at um, uh, Ace Comic Con. Okay. The week before that was Dallas at Alien Con. Uh, and week before that was somewhere, <laughs> maybe Cincinnati. Maybe yeah, I think so, right? Because yeah. I, I was there yeah. with you, and you were prepping for Alien Con there. Because you actually, uh, uh, Josh uh, produced a shirt that um, kind of uh, tied into the yeah. Area 51 raid. Yeah, it was a like concert T-shirt. Yeah, it says uh, it's. There's lot. There's like some basic stuff on there that everyone would know, and then there's some really nerdy shit in there that's yeah, like some deep cuts. Yeah, like there's Bob Lazar is in there. Who's like, just look him up. <laughs> yeah, dude, you you um that Area Fifty One for real. <laughs> that that Area Fifty One raid happened, um as as you had that shirt at Cincinnati, and you, I didn't you, realize it was yeah, gonna be that day that the con was going on. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, 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 I mean, it was worked crazy. out well. Yeah, we it was sold crazy. Out. And then I took a. The rest of them, I did another batch, got them printed in Dallas because nice. I didn't expect to sell them in Cincinnati. And then I took them to Dallas to the Alien Con, which was like History Channel's Ancient Aliens yeah. produced show. And uh, yeah, and I that's fun because you can do some real obscure stuff too there that that yeah. crowd will know your inside jokes. And oh, yeah, I mean, dude, like my um, I mean, my absent wife, you know, she she's a big Ancient Aliens fan. Oh, yeah, so. we talked about this. Yeah, man, yeah, I, I feel did like I send her uh, down any new rabbit holes. Uh, you know, it's the Indian cave. When uh, she Rakim reads temples, the, one of your new books, I, yeah. I think definitely, yeah. But we'll, we'll definitely get to that. We have some questions early on from our current audience here. We have, um, damn, dude. All right, let's see here. Let's put this. Uh, we have uh, Matt Edwards. Oh, core. Core says, shout out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Matt Edwards, who is a friend of both of ours, right? Yeah. Says, I thought it was going to be a good time. Then I saw Josh. Damn. Damn. Coming in with those bars for Josh. Um, Austin Allen Hamblin says, when will we get more core? I love core. Now, I'm thinking... That Where he's, are all these core people coming from? Damn. <laughs> I'm thinking that he's not talking about hardcore pornography. He, he must... <laughs> you must have a... Core um, is actually short for Manticore. Manticore, okay. Yeah. Core was the book... So, uh, when we were, like, super hot, when it was the first time we ever, like, hit the scene and G.I. Joe took off and... Yeah. and uh, at, me and Tim Seeley did a book, which was a reboot of my first ever published book called Minotaur. Yeah. Change it to Core. Short version is it's this, it's basically the labyrinth from the Greek myth of okay. the Minotaur is discovered by an archaeologist. And uh, it unlocks a demon that possesses him. And the demon is so tough, it physically transforms him into this thing. It turns out to be super powerful. And uh, one excuse to draw a big, super cool, badass monster dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of a total slacker screw up, and uh, Seely drew and draws the best giant monster guys. Damn, for those who don't know, that's Tim Seely, right? Yeah, who's now now more known as a writer. Yeah, Hack Slash, Batman, Green Lantern, uh, Grayson, Money Shot, his new book Money Shot. Um, but uh, so I mean, we knew each other back like way back in the day, like probably met when we were like nineteen or twenty, and yeah. then uh, um, traded, you know, comic stuff back and forth in the mail, trying yeah. to break in, and then. Uh, um, it was fun. It, it was like basically there was a parallel world, uh, uh, and then there was um. Hey, it's been it's been a long time. There's a parallel world, and it uh, 
evolved by evolving their magic technology. Okay. And we, we like can't naturally tune into magic and tap into it. Uh, but some humans can like learn it through spells and stuff, how to tap into it. And then others, there's very, very, very rare humans that can't access it. And that's like Matt, it's the difference between sorcerers and wizards and magicians and stuff. But uh, mostly we can't use it. Um, but there were rifts back in the day. So like some like Europe had these like dragons coming through and tearing everything up. Okay. And then uh, druids and wizards. And then the uh, like China had like these nice benevolent dragons. Yeah. And like the elves. And so all the cultures were influenced. And finally it was screwing up everything though. And there was a truce. We're going to block this off and uh, keep these worlds separate. Yeah. And there's a group called Cerberus that maintains the breakdown. So it's like magic men in black. Okay. And the um, uh, what happened was after, um, after a time, their energy sources were depleting. They used up all their magic. Yeah. And they were like, there's this place... We know about the other realm and like where they're just sitting on all this magic. They don't know how to use it. And that's all core. Just, just go take it over. That's core. And uh, Alex Crane's like the guy that gets turned into the, into the big monster, and he doesn't know what's happening. That he's turned into a monster, and like minutes later, all these weird kind of hippie magicians show up, and they're like, "You gotta go, you gotta go!" And then people show up trying to kill him, and they push him through a portal okay. into this world. And what it is is they're uh, trying to get him away from Earth because he's such an amazing source of magic. Okay. They need to get him where there is no magic left. And there's a wizard, the Archean, who goes back and forth. And in uh, in the, the world was Abaddon. And Abaddon, he's not very powerful. He's just like a Lex Luthor, super successful, like powerful guy. Because there is no magic to tap into. Yeah. But on an Earth, he's like the most powerful wizard ever. And basically, they're like, we can't let that guy get a hold of you. Because he has to do with like why you exist in the first place. You know what's so wild about you, man? You just said that this is so long ago, you know, and you I think you're having a hard time memory shit. <laughs> yeah, definitely, and then definitely, yeah. You just went into that <laughs> mythology deep, dude. Yeah. Uh, how many issues was that? It's like five issues. Um, we were really bummed because it only sold like 10,000 copies of an issue back then. Which now, <laughs> oh, like, now, oh, yeah. now that's a banger, you but, know? But you know, I was like paying full page rates and like back yeah. then coloring rates and it's like an image was, you know, they published it. That's right before we left Image 2 and they're just like, everyone's like, well... Man, we wish that was doing well enough to keep going. Yeah. Now, I sold part of the rights back in the day, and then I also had... It was a stupid rights thing. To get some other like other stuff back, I had I just basically 100% gave up core and to walk away from it. Damn, okay. And now, like, yeah, so it's kind of dead to me now. Yeah. That's the bummer of the whole thing. But, um, yeah. But, man, dude, yeah, I... Um... You'll follow, follow some stuff happening in Mercy Sparks, and you might see some things... If you liked core, you might see some things happening with... A couple of a character or two that a okay demons and physical transformation and stuff for sure yeah yeah man, that's about. cool <laughs> yeah um yeah i feel like uh mercy is your most well-known creation right uh my own personal yeah probably yeah, that it yeah. wasn't based off of like a licensed property that i added to right yeah, yeah. i mean we'll definitely get into yeah. some of that too uh we have uh uh zach o'connor who is a great friend of mine says good evening how is baltimore baltimore is good dude we, we had um we, we ran into a uh a marathon today yeah um it was a bunch of people just running and walking you know no and, pun <laughs> and dude like it was uh <laughs> Did, did you struggle to get past it, or were you just like adjacent to it? Because I, I I walked through. My it. Uber seemed. It took my Uber like forever to get through, and they kept changing Dude, the map. And yeah. then, but he dropped me. The dropped me off fine. So yeah, that's my first world struggle today. Yeah, dude. Yeah, we um actually for first world. My Uber like totally took like eight minutes, and it said it was gonna be four minutes. Mother, those <laughs> motherfuckers. Uh, I do have to say for those who are watching the YouTube video, uh, the angle that you see over here, the the larger angle is gonna go away. Um, in about uh, 20 minutes because I have to go check on our Uber Eats delivery. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, so that's core. And what does amaze me, and I'm being, I'm being, I'm being real here because I have, um, uh, you know, in our industry, I feel like um, we're, we're stuck to these tables at these shows. And so often people come up to us and they'll start talking to us about opportunities that we know are bullshit, right? Or, oh, yeah, or, yeah. or just... We have to meet someone whose work that we don't really enjoy. And I see a lot of that, like, uh, fake niceness stuff. But yeah. I want to tell you, and this is real. This is real. Your uh, uh, talent for building mythology really blows my mind, really. Because watch. When I asked you how many issues Core was, uh, based on what you said, in my head, I was like, that, 
be a hundred issues. But I, I knew it was gonna. Wanted it to be. <laughs> yeah, but dude, like what you had there and story wise was very well thought out. And the same is true of um, uh, I mean, can we talk about that that new book coming out of yours? Yeah, Arc World. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you talked about this book. It's called Arc World, right? Arc World. Yeah. To me, uh, in Cincinnati last month, and um, you had so much to say, and, and you. Um, did so much research for it and have built so much about this world and characters already and the book isn't even out yet. So you, you're you definitely a mythology man, right? Yeah, it's like I, part of it comes from like a love of researching this stuff. If you're writing about stuff you're interested in versus yeah. like some work for higher stuff you get into, you know. Yeah. But, but like um, it, it's a little easier but uh, I don't know. I just like got a big stick up my butt about plots where they don't know where it's going yeah and they just kind of like it's cool and trippy and it's like oh what's gonna happen here and then you find out the end the writer never had a fucking clue what they were gonna do oh dude i mean you you and i have come so to uh i have to make this stories. obsessive like bible that could just be turned into an rpg yeah for everything yeah with all the rules of the universe everything you know and then uh part of it too is like i want to i don't draw the books but i am an artist and i i um so i want to take the ownership of I created this. I designed this. Yeah. I drew all this stuff out. So I, um, plus I can't really write without drawing. Like I have to, even if it's another artist drawing it. So I developed the world and then, and, and then, uh, make all the rules and stuff and then like to hand it off. So I have to know how to access all that info. And I like to know, like it may never come up. Like yeah. Mercy Sparks has some super deep, weird, trippy, like universe rules and stuff that no yeah. one's ever going to even know about. Right. It's just so I don't, it, it keeps me from, uh, having like holes and stuff that pop into the story so like with you writing mercy now there's stuff where it's like oh shit like you know i try to say everything but then you know yeah. if um, i'm also like a mumbler and a rambler so it kind of like stutter around with it but it's like okay oh shit we never covered this like we can't yeah. do this because this will affect like 20 other things later right. that we can't work towards but it helps yeah. me like have a subplot pop in for like a couple pages and then yeah. just disappear for like two years and come back yeah. And fit right in because, um, you know, that payoff's important to me. And uh... Yeah, I mean, I think that makes it kind of organic, too. You know, that, that helps that you have that background that you can just pull from at any point. And actually, um, I'll say this. Um, as your co-writer now on Mercy, um, I, I like that. You know, I, I like that um, when I'm writing, I kind of have that uh, safety net below me knowing that I, I can't fuck up the mythology because <laughs> you'll catch anything that I've got wrong. Like what would happen ideally is I'd be like, here's the Bible, you know, yeah. like, but it's like, you know, this costs like a real Bible like that would be thousands of dollars to put together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so it's like, sorry, the Bible's kind of in my head, but, um, yeah, you know, and it, it sucks though when you do like some, I don't recall all of it. Sometimes I'm like, fuck, I got to go back and find like some note I scribbled down when I was like in the flow Yeah. and I shoved it away somewhere and I got to look through like, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> Man, we were at, we had some cool stuff planned for core that we like we put all these little things in the background that were supposed to be touched upon later. You do that shit, man. That that's a, a trait know, of you. Yeah. yeah. Like uh the newspaper. There's a newspaper blown by and remember there's one that says uh Cage was uh Coalition Against Gnome Exploitation. Okay. And we had this whole subplot, like, we were deciding, like, gnomes, trolls, you know, elves, all these things, like, what are the difference in all these, yeah. these like, species? Gnomes were supposed to be, like, a hive mind, like, very, like, weird. They're little elf dudes, but they're, they look like straight-up gnomes, but they're, like, you can't have a conversation with one. They're, like, real weird animalistic. Okay. But if you just, like, dumped them into, like, a, a broken, like, machine, they would just yeah. fix it. So people would exploit That's them. Cool. Yeah. And so we had Damn. this whole, that was, like, we had, we were going to do all these, like, racial tension like the um uh as magic was depleting yeah. it was a shift towards like who became uh who is maybe like maybe you were once a badass super powerful uh magical being and now oh you're if you happen to be like a little sprite yeah you're like well i'm totally vulnerable now yeah. and so they they like started to make alliances and and like you know the elves tended to ended up being the sort of the ones with the most like affluence and control and and the uh the spooky woods where all the like the goblins and stuff live or whatever you know or the like that's 
not like because they're evil like that's just the shitty area where like you don't get to live in the shining palace you live in the woods where no one can afford right. like you live in some mountain area so Damn. we were gonna play on all kinds of stuff it was a little ahead of its time probably fuck man i mean is it um not, not to touch on a nerve here but is it a thing that you can eventually or that you would try to get back oh yeah i i've made offers like hey it's here but i'm not gonna work on it without you know owning a piece of it again or yeah. you know, getting yeah, most of, of it back. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we can just create, that's the good thing when you're a creator, you know, you, Paul Miotti's brought this up a million times, you know, good reference there. Uh, just, he's like, I can create like a hundred more things, you know? Yeah. So if someone gets in, you get in that situation, you just walk away and do something else. It's true. It's true. But, um, so, but yeah, let's talk new stuff too. Um, uh, can you tell our audience, let's make sure we have no more questions here. Um, a bit about Arc World. So Arc World is uh, about I'm, I'm actually so there, there's this whole like movement of you know interest in um, on the probably the sometimes silliest level, but the ancient aliens. Yeah, there's really cool shit in that show that they show high quality video of that no one ever knew existed before. Yeah, and that's like the one thing that show does. And then uh, you know there's um. There's a lot of mounting evidence of. I'm gonna go on. So I'm gonna sell like Neil Adams on his like growing Earth theory or something I love, right now. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, hear, man. I, I love these rabbit holes. I'm ready of for like, this. I'm ready. I, uh, archaeopunk sci-fi is like what. There, there's all this growing interest in ancient alien stuff. Uh, you go on YouTube, and you look up, you know, mounting evidence about a common impact destroying the Earth in while humans were alive and having to rebuild. You look at uh, it's called common impact hypothesis. You look up more and more discoveries about laser scans in the Amazon jungle and out of Guatemala finding tens and tens of thousands of Mayan pyramids and buildings that no one knew existed before and DNA evidence uh, throwing a wrench in everything uh, showing that there's huge links between Australian Aborigines and Native Americans. Yeah. There's other species of humans that existed besides Neanderthal and Homo sapiens sapiens that we didn't know about. and all these things that are just like pushing this, changing the story and saying, look, we don't know exactly what happened, but it was not what we, it's not just people coming over the Bering Strait, walking down in the Americas as the Clovis culture. That's kind of just been like deep, you know, almost debunked even on a mainstream level. So take all that, yeah. um, take some of the ancient aliens ideas and be like, look, let's just, let's write sci-fi around that and say like, let's say, yes, this was real. Okay. And try to put as much effort and treat it as seriously as like you're writing like a little college thesis, and then write your story around that. And yeah. through that, that's how you do the world building. So I'm like, okay, if this is real, if Atlantis was real, if if uh, the Sphinx long ago predates Egypt, yeah. and the Egyptians just found it, if all you know, and similar things around the world with megalithic stone structures, um, are are actually a result of way way older cultures trying to preserve something, and then the people found it after civilization collapsed um, what was their technology like that built that what you know I um, what um, you know what could it have been like so I developed this whole world where they're very advanced in other ways they're very they're more primitive in other ways and it kind of all levels out to where they're pretty much the same level of technology we are now just different okay and it happens to be 13,000 years ago and uh, but they're much more advanced in understanding uh, you know, magnetism, anti-gravity, sonic technology for levitation, things like that. More than us, you're saying? Yeah, way more than okay. us. Like, kind of like they're on a whole Tesla level of, like Nikola Tesla level, okay. wireless communication and, uh, and wireless uh, electricity and stuff. So, but they don't have, like, regular computers. They're a little more earthy, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and then, uh, but it's a global society, and uh, that's sort of the this, this world. Yeah. And that's what I mean by like archaeopunk. You have to at least put that effort in it to it, and I equate it to uh, Star Trek, the way they're just zooming warp speed through space and they're going through portals and everything, and they're pulling it all out of their ass. But on some level, it's all based on real astrophysics and real science. Yeah, I'm trying to do that in reverse. Okay. Like, okay, if there is a lost civilization that was high tech, what was it? And then, uh, so um, you see stuff in the present day, and then we do flashbacks, and over time the story comes together. And you realize it's, uh, um, I call it Saga meets Ancient Aliens. Okay. Because hey, if you, if you read a, Saga. It's a good pitch, man. Yeah, because they're like, the characters are super modern. They speak modern. It's a couple. 
they're you know they're a normal couple they're they're young they're trying to fuck <laughs> <laughs> but they're they're you know they're just young people are they're you know seth is a guy who has this boring construction job uh which is actually quarrying giant megalithic stones and no one today can explain how we're lifted yeah um uh, Clea Toe is from Atlantis and she's living where he lives. He lives where we'll eventually become Egypt thousands of years later. Okay. And uh, it's basically about a couple, like two normal people that get caught up in a deep state espionage story. Okay. That has to do, just happens to be Atlantis um, uh, behind everything. And uh, it reads more like that. Okay. Kind of the way Saga is like, it's a weird fantasy sci fi Star Wars alien thing, but it right. feels like you're just reading some. Interesting. I mean, so so if the, if that's them there, then what what is the modern day story there? That's the modern day. So we kind of like uh, so we're gonna uh, it's gonna be a th- start with a three issue arc, a forty eight page at least forty eight page books that come out twice a year. So and, each issue is forty eight pages. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's great. And more like a French format, not bigger books, but like thicker I and mean, more pages and stuff. So you we kind of start in the present day. There's a big sinkhole on a construction site, and they discover like this giant. It's uh, called a Vimana, which is an old Indian uh, flying craft. This is some weird Vimana-like thing. It's like a, a stasis chamber or something. And uh, then we cut to the someone waking up in the in the chamber, yeah. and then you realize you're jumping back and forth in time. Okay. And it's like okay. in the present day, they're excavating this thing, and um, you find out like that other people are all well, already aware of these things existing, yeah. and. Um, but it tries. To, it avoids the stereotype, which is usually just like pictures of the scene in Thor where they find Mjolnir and <laughs> yeah, yeah. boom, it's all wrapped off. And the military's there, and this, the, you know, that stuff's cool. But it's been done a lot. So yeah, the military's there, but there's like a just a aloof <coughs> asshole Chinese tech billionaire who pops in, yeah. and he's on his text on his phone sending messages, and he's like totally not impressed by this thing. And you realize you find out why there's people working for him and. And then they mentioned like this family, the Vanderchilds, which are my like amalgamation of all the robber baron families that are you know still in power. Um, you find out that there's different groups of a power structure that know about these things existing. Yeah. And uh, when they, they, I'm kind of, I haven't like spoken about this out loud a lot, so I'm kind of like going out of order here. A hey little man, bit. Just, no, just hit it. It's cool. Yeah, they're um, it, it's cool stuff. Basically, they're looking at like. You find out there's these like capsules and these rel- artifacts all over the world that are discovered all the time. Yeah. And before any of the public knows about it, there's a sort of a unspoken a- arrangement between all the power structures in the world that they get all the cool stuff before we do. So okay. sometimes it's the old robber baron money, you know, the Rockefeller type, you know, can, you know. So I'm playing with some Illuminati and modern yeah. conspiracy stuff there, but the um. I'm sure the Vatican will pop in. Sometimes there's uh, a um, Pope got get There's a character him. named Vatican. She's like this Chinese techno billionaire dude. His name is Renny Zeng, and he's a dick. Okay, damn. <laughs> he wears okay. Winnie the. He just rocks Winnie the Pooh shirts and doesn't even care, because that's how pow- powerful he is. Damn. Okay. Yeah. That that sounds. There's a whole Winnie the Pooh thing. It's how South Park just covered it, but literally like a few weeks before that, I was explaining to Travis Heimel, the artist, like, hey. Make sure this guy's rocking a Winnie the Pooh hoodie under his uh, uh, shirt under his hoodie, yeah. just to show he doesn't give a fuck. Because that the president of China, hit, I heard by that Winnie uh, the Pooh's banned in China. Yeah. yeah, because he looks like him or what? It was a meme. Just people yeah. just trolling him because there's only so many kinds of resistance you can do there. Because I saw that and I was trying to find out where it started and and, and what the origin of that yeah. joke was. But yeah, and that oh, it's so ridiculous. Yeah. Um. So um. <laughs> Uh, but the, anyway, so yeah. the um, I have this thing. So when I'm explaining, you've dealt with this with me explaining to you plots. When I'm trying to explain all the inner moving pieces, yeah. I kind of stutter around and rumble, and like it's all clunky. But when you read it, it's easy. It flows. It jumps back and forth, timelines or whatever. And it's like it all flows. But I'm trying to explain it at first. It's like it, or, 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 no, 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 dude. I, I think it sounds good for you all. And I think that people are going to pause this as you're saying things and look up things that you've said. Because there's a lot that you've researched that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, honestly, what I want to know is um, I want to ask what specifically early on, because I can tell that this is a long time passion, got you into aliens. Because me, I I grew up in, in, interested in like sci fi and horror. And um, my only. Um, 
my only life experience really with, with aliens was um, this one time I had my friend uh, Laura. She was staying over, and we were young was at, at my parents' house, and we would um, she, she would bring these uh, dime bags, right? And we would uh, rip out, you know, uh, Goosebumps books, right? They yeah. had in the back they had these blank pages. Just so some just to hit that four, you yeah. know. Um, we'd rip out a blank page, smoke a joint in a goosebumps book page, and um, <laughs> and then we'd uh, uh, bake fries in the oven and just hang out, right. you know. Uh, so we we started the oven to bake the fries, and we were out uh, smoking that reefer right in the backyard grass, and and all of a sudden, dude, we were just kind of zoning out, and dude, I swear, I I saw. We saw a UFO, dude, you know? And um, it was... P- people always thought as if it was a blimp or a plane, but it had such a smooth, downward arc, yeah. you know? And uh, when, when it landed beyond us, I, I looked at Laura, and she was like, did you just... And I was like, did you just... And, and we agreed that we had seen the UFO. And we even went inside to turn on, on the news to see if there was oh, any yeah. news of an invasion. And we ended up burning the fries and having the alarm go off, and, and we got in trouble because we were smoking weed in the backyard. Um, but what, what what I want to ask you is, have have you had any close encounters? Have you had any times where you, where you thought yeah. that you saw an alien, maybe? I, had a, I saw. I've had one UFO sighting ever. The um, so Arc World actually, I, I kind of dodged the alien thing because I'm more fascinated by all this stuff. Uh, there's Easter eggs that are going to be in the book that point to real things that people can look up after but, but, every I mean, volume. But you say ancient aliens, though, you know? So I, it, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's like a general interest that, that it seems that you have had, right? I've always been into stuff as a sci-fi nerd and stuff, but I was really, really into astronomy as a kid. I, like, yeah. loved, you know, studying constellations and the history of the theories of the history of the universe and the planets and all that stuff. Loved it. And uh, I was uh, in my backyard in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, like, ninth grade. And my aunt Claire was with me. She was she's like six years older than me, so she's pretty young. And then we're we're just out in the backyard. Oh, you said sixty years older? Six. I was like, that is not young. Man. <laughs> I was like, yeah. man, that is not uh, young. So um, we uh, we're just standing out in the backyard. I don't know if I was like just being a geek looking at constellations, or if I was looking it was for school for something. Yeah. And for whatever reason, she was just hanging out. She was out there with me, and I'm looking. So I'm not looking for UFOs. Yeah. I'm I'm like looking at. Uh, constellations or something yeah. and trying to identify something and there's like a happens to be a plane going by okay and I, so i'm ignoring that because i legit thought it was a, a little plane moving yeah. at that plane speed and in hindsight i realized like oh it never it only had one light the whole time i should have noticed like there was like no blinking other lights but it's going like this and it, and uh and then it just goes stops and goes <laughs> it's just fucking gone damn and she and she saw it too and it, we're just like you see that? Yeah. Want to go inside? Yeah. Yeah. Is- we went inside because, like, you're like, what the hell else am I going to do? Yeah. I had her in my blanket the way they can't get me. Wow. And I, so I was, uh, but then, like, as I got older, you know, as a kid, I, like, I, I had this weird, like, stop being afraid of horror movies. Yeah. Like, I don't remember, like, probably, like, 11 years old or something and 12 years At old. At 11? 12, 13, definitely by 13. But I was fucking the alien movies were still scary as shit. Yeah. So uh I remember seeing um so I'm really dating myself here, but there's uh so one of the books of when the whole alien probing thing happened and like the gray aliens abducting you really yeah. got popularized was when Whitley Strieber wrote this book Communion okay. in the eighties. I never read that but uh he um uh I guess he wrote it he was a famous author he, well, they made a movie Wolfen that he uh, based on a book he wrote with Jack Nicholson and stuff, and then he just wrote this book out of nowhere that says like I was abducted by these things. I think they're aliens. I don't know what they were. Wait, and so is that the, the fiction plot, or he's saying that he he's was? He's saying this legit, dead serious. Oh wow, okay. He, me and my wife were in our like summer cabin, blah blah blah, in the woods, and all this weird stuff happened, and and it, he was like kind of ostracized and you know, and uh, considered he to have lost his mind and they made a movie with Christopher Walken yeah. based on communion and <clears throat> they used to play this commercial where it'd just be like this fate this this like thing backing out from the screen and you didn't know what it was and you realized it was like the alien head one of like the greys with the big black eyes yeah. and it just was so creepy and that's all the trailer was was this moving back and I remember like saying to myself like 
I'm not seeing that fucking movie. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And my dad and only and my dad ever did for like we never watched sports or anything like that. Like he's not wasn't into that. We just we go to movies all the time. And him and my stepmom got in a little argument one time and like so it's when your parents are like arguing and you're just like you know, just one you're sitting there, it's kinda of awkward and he was like, Well, I'm just gonna go to a movie or something and and, and I was like He's like, let's go see that communion movie. And oh, I was like, God, dude. Uh, and then she's like, just go. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm going to go see this movie. And I watched it, and I covered my face through like half of it. Yeah. And it scared the shit out of me for years. There's one scene where Christopher Walken's finally like losing his mind. He's supposed to be Whitley. Okay. Uh, and, and he's sitting in his dark living room. He's like, I know you're there. And there's this little alien head pops over the, around the corner and just moves back. And everyone that sees that movie, like, that's the most terrifying scene in the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Christopher Walken himself creepy enough. Uh, and so for years that tortured me. Yeah, I can imagine, dude. And that um, was, was that pre-UFO sighting or post? Uh, that had to be pre. Wow. Yeah. So that I never had, I never had any, I've never had any weird... I had one weird paranormal thing, which I put in Little Girl, which is kind of sounds boring when people talk about it, but the, um, no alien stuff. But I legit saw that was definitely a weird UFO thing. Oh, um, I, I, I just want to say, put in Little Girl means a book, okay? It, oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, yeah, it's a book that, that, that uh, I wrote that, that, that Dutch public. Put a paranormal published. thing in Little Girl. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that's, let me just make sure the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to check on our food. We'll be right back. Um... Yeah, we'll be right back. All right, and we're back. Um, we're gonna be on for about ten more minutes. You know, we we're we're, we're trying to grub out, dude. Yeah. You know, my Popeyes came I'm here. <laughs> the dude actually um came to the door because yesterday I ordered some some, some, some Hooters. Passing you know, in that bougie life. It's it's true, and I mean, if there's any proof that I am, I mean, the best feminist of all time, I ordered Hooters. I didn't go there and, <laughs> and indulge in the table-to-table action. I ordered it to come to yeah. me, you know? So that's, you know? That's, that's pretty That's pretty woke. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about as woke as they come, dude. I'm fucking crazy right now. Uh, so you you were talking about um, communion. When yeah. you so the wrap-up on that was just that I actually ended up working with Whitley Strieber years and, later. And he's the gentleman who wrote the that's, original yeah. book, who was also... That's the guy who Probed. he claimed all this stuff happened. Yeah, and his, I mean, I met his wife. His wife's like dead serious about it, and he's like a sort of a UFO guy, you know, known in those circles for all these books and stuff. Man, I'm, I'm gonna make this part a clip. So here's a great question: As someone who has worked with him, I mean, do do you believe him? And, and I'm not sure if you can say no. I yes, but believe that something happened to that guy. Okay. Okay. And I. No idea what it was, and he's so vague about it that he doesn't know. And and it's like, I don't know. Fuck. It seems it, it, you get really creepy vibes after you have a conversation with him about it. Yeah, <laughs> but but um, the uh, the book was about it was called the Nye Incidents, uh, black and white OGN. Yeah, the original graphic novel is just uh, you know about a coroner that's investigating these weird murders that um. No one can explain. Yeah, but they they resemble like cattle mutilations and weird like UFO phenomena, yeah. and she gets caught into this whole. Uh, there's a serial killer killing people that are claiming to be alien abductees. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you were the serial about killer's that. mo is he kills a uh, alien abductee. Uh, there people people in like these therapy groups and going to these conferences and stuff. Yeah. So um. But yeah. So uh, the funny thing is, I finally watched the movie later, yeah. and it looks like the fucking Muppets. Like, if I had not watched it like this as a kid, I would yeah. have, like, I, I was just hearing all the screams of, the, of Christopher Walken and stuff. Yeah. And, like, if I just watched it, I would it would have saved me years of torment because I would have seen <laughs> how goofy it was. I mean, it was super low budget. They had no money to make that movie. But would it, though? Because, I mean, the, the level of what scares us now has been really ramped up. This, I mean, if you look back at anything, it, old movies do look corny in general, maybe, you know? Maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah. those Muppets might have been pretty fucking fierce. They might have, they might have been. Um, now it feels like it was, like, stop motion king kong almost you know <laughs> but or um or fraggle rock or something yeah but yeah so uh but with arc world man it's more about you know looking at all the legit completely unexplainable things that are out there yeah. uh, and basing fun sci-fi around that just with that as a basis like um 
there, there's like a, an emergence of uh, I talked about the common impact hypothesis thing with about you with that. Yeah. So if you want to go down some rabbit holes, there's one which is like there's a layer of soot all across the North America and lots of other parts of the world that dates right at around like thirteen thousand years ago. Okay. That looks like we had a massive cosmic impact, and they think that they even know that it was this torrid meteor stream yeah. that may have hit it, and it hit somewhere in North America and would have just decimated the world and it, it ties into the end of the ice age and the, or in the reemergence of the ice age for a thousand years and the younger Dryas period which is what that's called um it times with the destruction of all the megafauna and woolly mammoths uh it kind of explains how you could find woolly mammoths completely preserved with vegetation in their stomach still jesus um that means they had to have frozen solid in 10 hours um okay, okay. there's a uh, um, on the weirdest level, it does time with when the Egyptians told the Greeks that Atlantis sunk. Okay. Which is, we get that from Plato. Um, the, uh, but then we've got uh, all the, the, the new LIDAR scans that are finding all this really old stuff, like the 60,000 Mayan pyramids. And they haven't even begun to scan the Amazon yet. You've got Gobekli Tepe, which is in Turkey, which is undeniably, like I think, 11,000 years old. Completely threw off the whole 6,000-year-old Mesopotamian civilization idea. Um, and then you've got the uh, DNA, which is tying, like I said, the Denisovan culture to, uh, which is the Neanderthals, Homo sapiens sapiens, there's Denisovans. Okay. They think they might have been like seven or eight feet tall even. There's, uh, you know, um, and we all have their DNA in us still, and the highest population alive today with their DNA is Australian Aborigines and Native Americans. Um, but the weirdest thing, so then you get into the megalithic monuments that no one can explain. And if you don't think that these are like unexplainable or weird, you just haven't seen them, the right ones. Like that's, what's cool about a show like ancient aliens. And then if you really just, you can just go find anything that's covered on there. Cause it's so short and go on YouTube and find like people that'll take you on these long tours I mean, the, the thing is true of what you're saying now. People can l listen to what you're saying and then do the yeah. same thing with this stuff. It's great. Like like Petra, that one that's called rock carved into a mountain, right? And it's uh, um, like a, it looks like a castle carved into a mountain, right? That goes on for seven miles. Yeah. Like you walk two miles to get to it. That's the famous thing. Indiana Jones made it famous because that's where the ark is supposed to be hidden. Okay. And that thing, you walk for five more miles and it's just like, the earth is littered with crazy uh, cities and uh, built into caves yeah. and that are no one knows how old they are. They hold thousands of people. There's one in Turkey that's like 20 stories deep, holds like 20,000 people, livestock, everything else. There's um, but there, there's uh, if you look up the Temple of Baalbek, Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek in Turkey, and look up the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, it is <laughs> the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. That's what I want to call it. That it's okay. one of the, it's one of the only one of the unfinished stones, but there's others that are built into the structure, um, and the uh, it's it's just there's no way we can move that thing, and, yeah. and uh, they were using it to construct things. And you look all over the entire world; these things are everywhere, and it's always the most unexplainable giant stones are on the bottom, yeah, and then the more primitive stuffs on top. So it's like okay, I I'm saying like for the story. Okay, yep, this was real, this happened, you know, this was some advanced culture, what was it? Um, of course, I add sexy people and guns and shit like that. Can I do it, man? And that, the, um, but the craziest thing I mentioned to you was one of the, um, if you draw a line, I think it even, it like, perfectly dissects the earth in half. It's not the equator, but you take a, a line, like a 15-mile wide line, and you draw it perfectly around the earth and a half and you pass through I think like I think it's Machu Picchu and then Cusco and Peru and, and you hit all these other sites these famous mysterious like homes of the gods and you know yeah. magical cities and stuff with all of them I have these unexplainable you know construction methods um, it goes all the way they line up right at Giza okay and guess what's in the middle of that tiny little line in the most remote part of the world isolated island in the world is Easter Island is in that line too. Yeah. It's just like when you layer all these things together, um, you know, correlations, not causation or whatever, you know, but it, it's, you're insane to say it's all coincidence and stuff, you know? So it's like, yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, it seems, um, how much of our world to you is, pure fun fiction and how much is you um f finding 
your answers yeah. for all, all these coincidences, you know? It's so baffling. I have no idea. Like, I, I honestly, I, I'll go out on a limb and say, like, I definitely think there was a really damn sophisticated civilization. Yeah. I don't know if they were in, you know, really, really high quality, like, sailing, like, boats sailing around. Yeah. You know, maybe it's possible someone discovered, like, harmonics and levitation and shit like that uh, for certain limited purposes yeah. and uh, amazing ways to like cut stone and, and uh, or maybe they had a concrete we don't understand and they could maybe all this stuff is just like yeah. you know wasn't even actually cut but the um uh, or if they had electricity and motors and stuff Christopher Dunn's this guy that does uh, all this research he's a um, mechanical engineer and he helps run a huge power plant or mechanical machine factory Jeez. Uh, uh, then he um, he just goes to Egypt and he goes to Peru and he like looks at these old monuments and brings all the mo the measurement tools yeah. says, this measures things to one ten thousandth of an inch and he looks at the symmetry of things and just says how will we build this how will we have to, what will we have to do to build this now yeah. and he's like this thing here just can't be built without a CNC machine or something like yeah. that's what we have to do to get this kind of symmetry. Yeah. And he's like, don't know how it was done, but I'm just telling you that's that's how we have to do it. Wow. And if you watch uh, Revelation of the Pyramids on you, that's a YouTube thing you can find different languages. All they do is they just like a third of the document documentary is uh, they go to modern day engineers and architects and say, well, how would we build this? Yeah. They don't say how do you think it was built. You know, they're just like, how, would how we do build you do this? it now? And what what they do is they don't let them off the hook on all of the detail that goes into all of the things like the mathematical knowledge the uh, precision the you know the everything that really yeah. exists in like say the, P the Giza pyramids you know yeah. that the average person just doesn't know yeah and once they learn you know you could say well you, you do this and you could start together and do this and you you know like well what about this and it's like oh I didn't know that it was aligned this way within this precision of a degree or I didn't know that it was actually eight sides not four sides i didn't know that the right. how do you explain that the um perimeter uh is the uh ratio or the perimeter to the height is this something like the ratio of the circumference of the earth to the, the radius of the earth so, Fuck. I, so for the story i want to say that's the stuff that's like no one knows how they did it or how they knew it yeah but it's real the mathematics are real there I, you can say it's coincidence if you want. I'm not going to for my story. <laughs> right. My idea is that you know this is something about the Earth being pummeled over and over again, mm -hmm. and it wasn't just once. And then you have the people have been trying to keep the knowledge alive, and uh, you know, and wherever they can, they like keep pockets of the technology hidden. So whenever because they don't know how bad things are going to be. So there's like multiple phases of society yeah. that, that that crumbles and. Is yeah. rebuilt and so like let's say you know today we knew we we're gonna get hit by an asteroid and there's nothing we could do about it and it's gonna happen in 20 years you know we've already got crazy underground military bases now yeah. you know we have huge boring machines that build tunnels you know all over the place pretty easily um, then there's that's a the good weird... point yeah some people would survive yeah oh there's are there's definitely a continuity of governments thing it's not even a conspiracy thing it's like yeah. no we if we get hit by nukes and stuff you know they're not thinking cosmic impact, but like if we get hit by nukes, we're gonna we're gonna we have enough things to keep us alive for years. There's you know the billionaire like Bill Gates seed banks and all this stuff. Yeah, and I think that's in Antarctica. There's um, we already have that stuff. It's real. It sounds crazy, you know. But what if the whole world had to become like doomsday preppers? Yeah, and and, uh, and then no one knew exactly how bad it was gonna be. So what are you, you're gonna like? Okay. Hopefully it's not that bad. We can, you know, survive here for a while, come out 50 years later or something or 10 years later. Yeah. Or maybe things are so fucked, you know, you eventually get like 20, 20 uh, worst case scenarios, you know, or 20 different scenarios. One of them might be like we have to build indestructible shit that will last forever and survive anything and uh, have all this knowledge encoded in it so that when we finally fucking emerge... As long, all we have to worry about if we build that is we could just keep teaching the next generation this knowledge so that they can, like, if they forget half of it, they, some group of people still has the info to unlock it all. So when they start to rebuild, they can, it's like a cheat sheet. 
Yeah. Like just imagine the pyramids are a cheat sheet, you know, and all these different structures. They have mathematical encoding in them, and that can kind of ties into like all the Masonic stuff and all the symbology they have, you know, um, you know, for the story itself. Yeah. Um, I like that idea. Now I'm adding like more fun shit, like you know, this means there's cha little capsules and stuff around that to this day you might find that have like high tech Atlantean technology. Yeah. Where if you know what to do, man, you just bust that shit out, put that suit on or something, or you like, you know, get this weapon or this levitation thing or something, and you're good to go. <laughs> that is um, fun, man. And um, I got a whole other thing with psychedelic technology on there too. That they're they're oh, masters of that. I want to check your food really quick. Um, but while, while I do that, can you tell me and everyone else when uh, Arc World Number One is going to come out and what, when are they going to order it? Um, and uh, how to go about checking out your older work? Like, uh, I mean, you still do Mercy Sparks, yeah. And um, if if anyone is intrigued by Core, I mean, I want to go find Core now. Is there a way to do that? Ah, uh, there's trade paperbacks out there. Um, it's um, um, uh, I just go K O R E Core. Um, and uh, yeah, Arc World is going to be. Uh, it's coming out in the spring. Maybe March. I don't want to commit to that yet, but okay. the artist Travis Heimel is cranking along. Jason Smith, awesome colorist, working on it. Michael Myers is lettering. Um, we have some amazing covers by Dan Leister, Jen Brumall. Oh wow, nice. Um, Larry Watts. Hey, really? Uh, oh shit. The um, my boy Larry. <laughs> we've got uh, uh, Christopher Harris. Okay. Just this badass, like super detailed uh, one with one of the characters, El Mac, who's. Uh, more like the Mayan culture. Um, yeah, there, there's, we're, we're, we're doing, we're making, growing big with it. Since we're doing like Kickstarter, yeah. we're going to do the store distribution. We're going to have Comic Con specials. Yeah. So the thing is, with nowadays, you know, indie comics, we're finding our customers are very split on how they prefer to buy the books. Yeah. Some of them want it. They, they just want to wait until they see you at a con and they'll buy it. Some oh, of them, that, that's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fact. Some of them uh, want to. Uh, just go to the comic shop like normal or the old days and get it. And some of them really are all about the Kickstarter, which is awesome because they make stuff possible. It's true. And uh, yeah. Mercy Sparks is going on. Pat's co-writing on it, kicking ass. Um, it's your boy. Making angels twerk. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we've we got, um, yeah, Larry Watts is drawing that. Um, oh, shit, we can say that now. Um, maybe. Hey, there we, we go. Did. <laughs> Larry Watts, who um, I had a long run with him on Robin Hood. Um, he and I have worked together on multiple some things. Pages of show. Yeah, he's um, Larry Watts is going to be that boy in Mercy Sparks. We uh, yeah, the Mercy Sparks maestro. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Announced. Hey, there we go, man. There, there we go. Um, uh, and that's issue fourteen is coming out when then? Uh, if we can say, you know, we don't have that side date yet. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> but Mercy is going to be moving to a similar format like Arc World, where we're going to do forty-eight pages. It's forty-eight. Forty-ish. Pages at least twice a year, so you know, you know. Hell yeah, it's kind of like a quarterly series, but we'd rather save it, do thicker issues, make them T H I C C. Make them thickies, dude. Now I have two final questions. Um, your food's gonna be here very soon, um, but just can you show everyone here? I'm not sure how flexible are you are about th that sock game. <laughs> yeah, you know, let's compare, dude. Oh wait. Oh. Let's compare. Let me get off my bucket feet. These are oh both. shit! Check out bucket Check feet. Out. Give us a sponsorship. That's uh recommend my boy Lance. Damn, it's a nice shoe. Threadless. Lance Curian is an awesome uh, guy, and we're gonna have our own devils do bucket feet at some point. I just have a design. All right. So the sock is some French fries. It's French fries. The and dinosaur. A -Rex, and it says, "I said no onions." <laughs> Damn, I don't that's know awesome. If you can read that or not? That's amazing. <laughs> I had a. No I, idea I why some, this exists, but I had to have it. I have some Christmas cats over here. Some cats kissing under a mistletoe, you know? I do have dogs playing poker. Hey, nice. I think my favorite ones, though, uh, I do have some, like, Mayan airplanes. Yeah, that's cool. Those little Mayan, they found that Mayan jewelry from, like, it's like a thousand years old, but several of them, like, look like little jet fighters and stuff. Okay, that's so awesome, man. I, I, I love some beautiful, and my avocado, unique socks. my avocado sucks. Oh, I think Amy has some of those, too, actually. Yeah, she, has, uh, she also has uh, some... Uh, some ham socks. She has like a slice <laughs> of ham. ham. Yeah. Um, now, my last question is: um, I love a good strange convention story, and one of my favorites is um, uh, last year at Cincinnati, 
it's not even a story, it's just an incident. You and I were next to a booth where there was a young gentleman hired who, uh, every time someone passed, was passing by, oh, he shit, would go, yeah. it's over here! That was his bit, to get people to come over. He said, it's over here! It's the whole time. So, ha- have you run into any strange characters at conventions? Like, what is I one? I think I'd have a dinner at that with that guy in a in like a group setting. No after fucking hours. way. Dude. Yeah. Was he the the same? He's more way? personal. He okay. Like, hey, hey. He's uh, if we're thinking of the same guy, he was all he's on a on more than the average person, but not on like that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I didn't want to punch him the next time I saw him as much. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. Con. That's nice. That's, that's a nice little uh, yeah. coda to that yeah. story. Yeah. 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 Um. Have you ever gotten any um, in any physical fights? Have you gotten chased? Have you gotten um, anyone? Uh, kind of near Comic to you? Con, I had to tell a guy tell me he was gonna blow my brains out. Damn, dude! <laughs> what was it? A, a customer or a, a, a an ex? Maybe that's not was even a, funny. That's just fucking dark. That, yeah, that that is dark. This guy was going around and he was uh, he was um. I saw him like walking by the booth. He met with violence, right? Not this sexual. Was York, this was New York Comic Con. Yeah. This is like four years ago, maybe. I saw him walking by the booth. I saw him like walking around, just like kind of slinging his like plastic baggies, holding books, in and just going, "I hate comics. I hate comics." <laughs> it was like I just noticed it, but <laughs> yeah, not to the degree you might think, because there's so much crazy shit that happens. You're just like, "All right," and you just you're yeah. talking to someone. I mean, at that show especially, yeah. And then he came by and he like he kept asking about different covers of books okay to the point where it was like when bad santa and billy bob thornton's finally loses it when the kids ask about sandwiches and he's like are you fucking with me what's yeah. with you and sandwiches like he kept asking about the books what about this cover and you'd answer it and you go well what about this one and he, so is this a different one and he's pointing to the same cover again and this went on for like five ten minutes and the people Dude. working at the booth were just being almost like i, I was like you know all right i'm in charge so I'm allowed to say this person's getting fucking stupid and can yeah. leave. Yeah. But they're being nice to him. So finally, I, I let this go on for a long time and he's getting in other people's way. I go, So are you going to buy one or not? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, he was just waiting for that. He throws a $100 bill down on the table and he's like, and he just starts gloating about how much money he has and everything. Oh and, shit, he's and flexing. He, yeah, and he's like, and he's like, I don't have to buy all this if I want to and stuff. And then he like leaves. And then, but he he was by then, he, he was like, we could tell he was drunk by then. Yeah. yeah. I'm assuming he took the $100 back. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then he, and then he's like, he's like, man, I'll blow your fucking brains out. And, you know, this guy was out of it and wasted yeah. and everything. And uh, so I, I, I told, I told Reed, you know, and I, oh, first yeah, I, dude. well, yeah. I started to like, first it was like, my wife and then Kit was at the booth and uh, so it's like okay <laughs> it was a stupid moment like get the women out of here you know yeah. but I was like go get security I was just like go get security you know and we'll stand here meanwhile Nick who's working for us who's also like moonlights sometimes to this day is like a bouncer okay. I, I works the door to bar and is not afraid to like throw someone around Yeah, dude, yeah. he's ready to like kill the guy and uh, I was like nope please don't hit anyone either because that'll be like all that you know comes out of this and uh so, Bleeding cool, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So then uh, I learned how long it takes security to get to your booth, which is a long time. And then yeah. it's not the cops, it's security. And they're just standing around like, whew, whew, uh, we better call the cops. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, dude, yeah. So finally cops show up. And then uh, the sad thing was, and this was before the whole Phoenix incident that started the whole gun scare at all the cons and yeah. stuff. Um, so... They were just like he. They just kicked him out, and I'm like, "You guys, this was the RFID badge. Did you get his name? Is he banned from every future show ever? Do you have his name? You know, or at least did you check his badge to see if he stole that?" And and it's just like, no, they just kind of got rid of him. So I'm like, "Wow, I'm glad it's New York and there's enough people you can just leave in a crowd, and I don't have to worry about this guy really being out there." Yeah. But damn, that's crazy. I'm sure we have more fun, lighthearted, crazy stories. Like a, I mean, that's a pretty good one, though. But that know? was... Yeah, it's pretty compelling. Memorable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I told this story on the podcast before. Um, I'm just checking your food now. Um, I'm glad that Pat is saying to my food needs. That uh, I was pitching to Black Mask, and um, Matt Pizzolo, who runs Black Mask, only had about 
um, like a minute or two before he had to go to the next panel. So I, I was going real quick. And then a guy bumps into us and vomits right next to us because he was drunk. <laughs> it just ruined the pitch meeting. You oh, know? my God. Um, and I, I, I legit so haven't funny. been back to New York since because it, it's, it, it's a crazy show. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're out there getting your life threatened, you know. Um, uh, and I'm just... I can say I've been doing conventions for 23 years exhibiting and that's the only time that's ever happened but yeah and that's pretty good odds actually <laughs> that's pretty good odds because you think you, you travel you meet all kinds of people only get one death threat that's pretty that's pretty good dude that's pretty good yeah. um but uh yeah we out here yeah um so <laughs> listen if you if you see this live we'll be at baltimore again tomorrow if you're watching this on youtube it's not live where we're gone but if you are seeing it live, come to us tomorrow. You know yeah. it's over here. Yeah, right. It's over here. <laughs> yeah. We're over here. We're here, dude. We're um your table uh, number twenty two ten. And oh shit, and I'm twenty twelve. You know, I'm that. Yeah, you're the end of the world booth. That's man. me, man. That's yeah, me. I'm the one with the Mayan shit, man. Why you gotta steal? You my know, number? you would think you'd be twenty twelve, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, thank you for doing this, man. This is fun. Um, thanks. And listen. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Oh, uh, dude. Anytime, you know. Uh, but check out Devils Do uh, in previews every month. You um, have a beautiful book called Little Girl that is uh, just. It's fantastic. You know, it's a hit. Dude. Illustration's good, at least. <laughs> yeah. There's some cool shit happening with that book that we should be able to talk about. We're not yet, but. I would love to. If you don't get on that and buy that book and find that first issue and you're a collector, you might regret not having it. Yeah, it's a good first issue to have. You know, it's. um. I mean, I don't mean to just prolong this because we do have that food incoming. But my my final little question for you is, does it get... I mean, we live in this industry and we work here where we have all these fun, cool things happening and we have to keep so much of it under wraps for so long. It sucks. It's, yeah. It, yeah, it's yeah. a pretty crazy part of this industry. Do, do, does that wear on you or do you stop being excited when you know that you can't talk about something yet? Or I think you get to the point where you got enough cool shit to talk about anyway. So you're like, you've uh, always got point. something you can talk about. It makes it easier to like hold the other stuff back. It's true. Yeah. And actually, and, you know what? As far as... Um, I, uh, the other... Yeah. Sorry. No, yeah. The problem really is once you tell people about it, you just still got to like... Repeat it 25 times to get it to stand out. Oh, that's a fact, yeah. Like, these days especially, there's so much noise. That, that's so, very true. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to say to end this is what I love about what you do is that there are um, certain publishers where, um, you know, they're just churning out books. But you are also a creator at heart. And you uh, publish books that are awesome, that you are really invested in, and you can tell through your writing and your creation. And I truly appreciate what you do as a publisher and as a creator. So thank you. Thanks for making awesome stuff, man. Thanks. And thank you for watching. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, I'm fucking pissed. Thank I'm you, pissed. Jo thank you, Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, subscribe, you know. Um, but no, yeah. ser ser seriously, you know, we um, have a, a family here that is built on uh, your subs, your comments, your likes. So please share the shit out of this. You know, buy, uh, pre order Josh's books, and they're going to be on Kickstarter and yeah. in Diamond Previews. Well, well. well, so if you're, if, if you're a big weirdo like me and you're into the, the ancient history stuff, ancient alien stuff, uh, archaeopunk.com, because I'm claiming that. I want the genre to be bigger than just my book, but I'm yeah. staking the claim on like at least coining it. Uh, do it, dude. So, A-R-C-H-E-O punk.com. And you get a free download of the Arc World Prepper like preview book. Yeah. Um, we're going to be posting other fun stuff that links to like what's inspired some of the story. Devilsdo.net. And that's our food. Our oh, food's here. All right. Listen. Dungeon. We're out. Thank you very much. Space between.